As you can see for today's Q&A, we will be allowing the goats some time to be on their tethers and brows, which we had some questions about, while we answer your homesteading questions. We're also going to be doing some puppy training. Got to get it all done because there's not enough time in the day to do one thing at a time. You got to do like eight things. This is homesteading. I wonder if this goat will be over my shoulder the entire time. This is how I do animal training. You will notice the puppy is right onto my side here in a little cage. The goats are tethered behind me and I'm getting some work done. That's one of the questions. Oh, that light went off. That's one of the questions we're gonna cover in today's Ask Homesteady. We also have some more great questions like, will grazing the goats like this help with their worm load? Will grazing goats be able to tell if something they're going to eat is poisonous? Why did we decide to get a mini jersey? You want to start a homestead business. Your significant other doesn't. How do you get the two of you on the same page? How can you convince them that starting a little homestead side hustle is a good idea? We're going to answer all those questions and a whole lot more in today's Ask Homesteady. Welcome to another episode of Ask Homesteady. This is the weekly show where we answer all the bazillion questions that are left on our, I don't like the word bazillion, that's just uneducated. We answer as many of the questions you've left on our homesteading channel here as we could possibly get to in one hour-ish. If you would like to get a question answered on Ask Homesteady, it's not that difficult most of the time. All you have to do is hashtag your question ask homesteady in the comments below so find a video put your question hashtag one word ask homesteady if you do that you have about a 30 percent chance of getting your question on the show because now we're getting about 150 to 100 questions a week and we get about a third of that in the actual show Today, we are going to be answering lots of questions. You'll notice the goats behind me are tethered. We did a video this week on tethering goats. I'm working on training them to tethers, and part of that is just being able to observe them, monitor them while they're out eating. Lacey doesn't love it. She doesn't eat a lot, but she's at least putting up with it for now. Gizmo does a little bit better. We'll answer some of your questions on tethering. I'm also wrestling with a puppy right now. She's sitting right next to me in this little cage you see that's around me. I'm gonna be training her to just sit next to me and be calm. Training a puppy is a war of attrition. It's like a two year long siege. You know there's a good ending. You'll get lots of good things when the city finally gives up and you can go in there and this is going downhill, so I'm gonna just stop with this illustration. Come on, pup! That's what's at the end of this. Come! A well-trained pup that will listen to you. Unfortunately, it takes a couple years to get there. So I'm going to discourage this puppy from doing naughty things. While I answer your questions, let's get to the first question. Superfan Dean, who changed his picture on YouTube, and I didn't recognize him at first, he asks one of many questions that I'll probably get in today, because his questions are usually really good. How do you expect the tethering grazing to help manage the worm issue? As you know, last week we made a video all about worms. Yesterday's video covered worm treatment. We've been dealing with this issue in Lacey. Lacey had a, you know, pretty strong worm load on her. You can see her now over my shoulder, a little bit blown out because it's sunny right now. Uh, she's in much better shape because of the treatment. Part, the biggest part of fighting worms is dealing uh, management. It's property management, making sure that you're moving your animals, that you have the right animals for your property in the right places. Tethering your goats can absolutely help with worms. The biggest way you're gonna get worms, a worm problem with your goats is by leaving them in the same spot where they chew all the brows down low. Goats are not as susceptible to worms as say sheep are because goats as you can tell from the one right over my shoulder, are browsers. They don't mow the grass down low like sheep do. Goats hold their head up high and chew weeds. A lot of times you'll see a weed like the ones behind me, like chewed in half, right there, that, sit. 
they won't go all the way down to the bottom, and that's where the worms are. Worms, as we talked about in our video from last week, uh, the eggs are in the poop of the animal, they poop it out, and the larvae crawl up the stalks, but they can only get up about six feet or so, or nope, not six feet, that would be an incredibly tall weed, six inches. So if a goat's walking through different areas, constantly browsing on high up stuff, Lacey will even jump up and chew from the tree that's behind me, they're pretty safe from worms. If you leave them in confinement for a long period of time and they mow that down, then they can get into trouble. Now, do I think tethering Lacey and Gizmo is gonna help our worm issue? Maybe a little bit. Right now where they are, they're in a pen that's goat escape proof for the most part. And it has been mowed down. It's not the perfect spot to keep them, but we're trying to get them out each day on the tether filling up their bellies away from the worms. It might help a little bit, but they'd be better off if they were constantly out of that pen, which they will be, uh, but hopefully by next season we'll have our rotational pasture fencing all set up correctly, and we'll have our system in place. It is a big elaborate thing to set up a rotational grazing system, and it's taken us a lot of time to figure out how to do it right here. We're not there yet. We're getting better ideas each month that goes by mostly by doing wrong things time after time after time. We'll update you in an upcoming video about pasture management and what we're doing here. That's why we don't have a lot of cows and goats right now because they are not moving as much as they should be and if you're not moving your animals as much as you should be, the next best thing to do is have way more space for them than they actually need. So right now, the worm issue should be okay. We're gonna keep an eye on it. Lacey's looking really good. Things have been improving, but we're gonna stay on top of it. And tethering is a great tool to help with your flock if they were on a tether all the time. However, as we talked about in our tethering video, it's not safe to leave them tethered without watching them. So the reality of them being on a tether all day is just, I, I spend about an hour a day out here working on the computer outside, enjoying some sunshine and training puppies and goats. Like that. I don't want her barking at that goat. That's naughty behavior. War of attrition. I will lay siege to this puppy. Next question. News flash. Beep, 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 beep. If you're in Western Pennsylvania, I, on Saturday, me and my family will be going on a foraging tour with Homesteady's uh, go to forager, Jared, the foraging beard on Instagram. We're gonna go on the Foraging Beards foraging tour. I'll have a link below or an email below or something below with information on that. So if you'd like to, it's not, not a home study tour at all, we're just going, but if you'd like to meet up, Jared was on the podcast a while back about foraging. He's a great guy, awesome woodsman, and we're really excited to do some foraging with him. And uh, join us, join Jared's tour. It's totally free and he's gonna teach you about finding wild edibles and I'll probably be too scared to eat any of them. <laughs> but I trust Jared, he's good with this stuff. So a link below for the foraging tour if you're in Western Pennsylvania, you know, within the radius of Pittsburgh, it's not too far from, you know, Pittsburgh. So if you're near Pittsburgh-ish, details below. And maybe we'll see you Saturday. Email me, Austin, this is Homesteady if you're gonna go and uh, we'll keep our eyes peeled for you at the meetup, foraging tour. Lady Music wants to know if Ladybug will naturally wean Luna. As the pregnancy takes, will she naturally wean her? This is not something that doesn't happen. Some cows will naturally wean. Calf sharing is kind of an art and a science. There's a lot of science behind how the animals work, but there's no strict like this is how it's gonna work for you every time. So with calf sharing, there's the possibility that Ladybug would wean Luna. However, there's also the possibility she won't. So we're just gonna keep monitoring. And as Ladybug goes further along in the pregnancy, we will dry her off, which means Luna will be weaned. But we also won't be milking at that time, which is partially why we got these girls because they sure are not great at weed control. So, next question. As many of you know, the pregnancy with Ladybug, we're not sure if she's actually pregnant yet, I shouldn't even call it the pregnancy. Uh, we attempted a pregnancy with artificial insemination. Jorge wants to know if she doesn't get pregnant from the AI, 
Uh, will you rent a bull next time? Great question. I don't like the idea of renting a bull and bringing a bull on the property. We don't have very good fencing for a big, strong, hormone-filled animal to be, you know, running around with our girls. So I would prefer to stick to AI. AI works. That's how bigger companies do it. The guy we brought on the farm is a professional. And if it doesn't work this time, I'm sure we have more semen that we purchased. We have more straws. We'll try it again next time with AI again. I can't say that we'll never try it with a bull, but that's not our number one choice. We would prefer to stick with AI. El Chin wants to know, how about making cheese? Easy to store than milk or may maybe homemade butter? Would be nice to watch. And thanks to Superfan Dean for adding Ask Homesteady hashtag to that question. Remember, if you want your questions answered, there better be an Ask Homesteady hashtag because I just, there's too many questions now. I don't even look for questions unless they have the hashtag or someone nicely added the hashtag like Dean. Thank you, super fans, for doing that. Elchin, uh, making, we have made cheese with Ladybug's milk. The easy cheeses to make, like most things in life, if it's easy, it's not great. The easy cheeses aren't super delicious cheeses that we like. The cheeses we like in this house, you know, some good Monterey, Monterey Jacks and Cheddars and, you know, the stuff you, you put on like homemade nachos. Uh, I like a good pepper jack cheese. I mean, we're not like fancy, fancy cheese eaters. You know, the stinky cheeses, but you know, the basics, the harder cheeses are hard to make. Maybe that's why they call them hard cheeses. Soft cheeses are easier, uh, but with a cow, generally you're, you're dealing with like mozzarellas and queso blancos. A good mozzarella can be very good, but it, we have not yet made a good mozzarella. So it's a work in progress. We've been trying it. As far as butter goes, come on, pup! getting antsy, but he still better come when I call. There, good dog. A real good dog wouldn't have walked away in the first place. As far as butter goes, we have done butter. There are older videos of ours where we did butter. Place. Butter is, it, it's delicious. It's hard to make a little bit of it, and it doesn't keep very long. We like to keep our butter at room temperature, so we're looking into ways to improve that. Doing a better job at making our butter would be one of them, getting more of the water out of it. And also we found this really cool thing we're gonna be getting soon. Uh, I think it's like a butter bell or something. We'll do a video on it. That might help keep it room temperature and also still good, not having it go bad. So we'll update you there, Elchin. Catherine wanted to know why don't we ultrasound Ladybug to make sure that she's ready. Apparently you can ultrasound and see follicles and know that it's time. Catherine, really it's just a price thing. To get a vet out here with an ultrasound machine would cost more money than we can invest. Ladybug is, she's our family cow. She, we don't have a huge herd here where we could make a good write off with that kind of expense. So we're gonna just breed her when the AI tech says he thinks it's good and hopefully that worked. Kiru wanted to know, was Ladybug's first breeding AI or with a bull. Ladybug has actually had three breedings. So Luna is the second calf she's had. That was from a bull, as was the first. So two bulls, this was her first experience with AI. And hopefully, the best experience with breeding. Although Luna was great, nothing wrong with Luna. So we're just hoping that this one takes and it all goes smoothly. Lots and lots of cow breeding questions. Um, we have another Elchin asked, at what age are you going to breed Luna? So generally the guideline is after a year, somewhere around 14, 15 months, but it's not specifically age, it's more of a weight and body confirmation thing. So we'll make sure Luna is the right size for a mini jersey. Luna is a mini jersey, not a full size. Uh, so we'll make sure that she's ready to go and then uh, we'll be obviously making a video of that. You'll know when it happens. So Elchin also mentioned that she doesn't want me or he doesn't want me. I'm sorry. Don't know if it's a guy or a girl. Nature of YouTube names sometimes. They wanted me to not go into a studio to record these but to be outside. And there you go Elchin. Today we got goats grazing behind me which Lacey's actually doing an okay job today. She's doing better than she has. Gizmo's going crazy over there. They have not done any significant damage to the weeds, but at least they're getting comfortable on the tether, so that's good. 
The next question. Faith wants to know, what's y'all's favorite coffee? Faith, I have gone on a progression from being a non Dr warm drink drinker to a tea drinker to a coffee drinker to a espresso drinker so now I drink everyday espresso I think that trend could be matched as I get older and run my own business I have gone descended into the stronger harder caffeinated drinks what's next Oh man, where's rock bottom with this path? I like a good latte. We have an espresso machine we talked about in the last Q&A. Uh, an espresso pods, ksh, latte, mm, a nice. And I like like a medium espresso on the, on the intenso scale, like a five intenso, all the way to like a nine. I'm not one of those like 12 intenso guys. I stop at about a nine, so that seems to do the trick. Laura asks, a great question, what is Accountant Mike up to? Those of you who listen to the podcast and once in a while caught him on video back in the early days, uh, know my best friend growing up, farm accountant back at Squash Hollow Farm. Accountant Mike was a regular part of the Home Study Show. And now that we have put the podcast on a hiatus till uh, essentially fall, we have not seen Accountant Mike for a long time. And of course we miss Accountant Mike, not only because he's hilarious, but he had a great bit to the show about, you know, looking at hard numbers and making sure things make sense with the things that we do on our homestead and warning us about bear attacks. Stay tuned, Laura. You might be pleasantly surprised next week. That's all I have to say about that. If you're really missing Accountant Mike or you don't know who we're talking about, go and check out our podcast. Links below for that. And he will be on the podcast when we return with the podcast in the fall when my studio is built. Sorry, Elchin, I am going to build a studio. It's hard filming this outside. Whiskey Bent Farms asked a question a few people asked. Uh, we talked about giving hormones to Ladybug to bring her into her cycle so she could be bred. And we talked about how Kendra could not give those hormones, only I could, and actually wound up that our AI tech gave the hormones. Those hormones are the same hormones a cow produces naturally when she comes into her cycle. So they are the hormones that get her ready to have a baby. Those hormones can affect a human woman as well if she were to accidentally prick herself or some people even say inhale the, the mist from it. Um, contact on the skin, some say. I, I don't know all the science behind it. This is just a quick answer for you. You can look more into it. But essentially, those hormones can affect a woman who is like my wife, still at an age where she can have a baby. If she were pregnant, which we said in the last video, she is not pregnant. Don't y'all be guessing in the comments. Um, if she were, though, to be pregnant, it could cause a miscarriage or it could mess up her cycle. So those are the things you just, the guy guys give those shots. You don't mess with them if you're not a dude because they have no effect on a dude. They're not gonna mess with my cycle. We got some dog questions from our last Q&A and Grace Homestead, uh, you can notice I have moved the camera here so y'all can see, I'm getting a y'all now, all these comments. Uh, we're gonna talk about a puppy here so we're gonna look at the puppy while I'm doing this. I answered some of her questions. She has three dogs. Uh, she killed two guineas, but she was three years old. It was easy time to train her. Now she doesn't even look at them, but now she has an older shepherd who's wonderful around chickens. The Pyrenees slash lab, that's quite a mix, a livestock guardian slash bird dog. <laughs> um, she's the one she's worried about. When she walks her lab, her lab likes to pull, huh? The Pyrenees lab likes to pull. Interesting, right? And she's gotten crazier on leash. She likes to jump, which is a huge no-no. That's absolutely a no-no. I cannot stand dogs who jump. So, Grace wants to know, she doesn't think the puppy is hopeless. She thinks there's hope. Good, Grace, I like that you're still positive and optimistic. What do we do? So, I have never trained an older dog out of bad habits, Grace. She's one and a half, so technically she's still like a puppy. You should still be able to teach her. Okay, so this is good news. I actually did train Bones. A lot of his leash training happened at about a year and a half old. 
So that's good news because I had not yet taught him to heal. I could do an updated video. Right now, the puppy, and I'll stop with this like looking down camera because it's just a weird angle. It's a little too, too personal there. That's better. Right now, the puppy is just learning basic manner. So I'm making sure that she is not jumping up. I'm making sure that she jumping up. I mean, every time she jumps, you just knock her down. She jumps up, knock her down. I mentioned earlier in this Q&A, training puppies is a war of attrition. Mostly you're waiting for them to get a little bit older and only really focusing on the worst things that they do. I love dogs. I cannot stand puppies, but you need to take care of your puppy and train your puppy so that you get a great dog, like Bones over here. So the fact that you don't have a puppy anymore is actually not a bad thing. She's only a year and a half. It's not too old to fix this issue. You need the right tools. First off, let's talk about your leash. See this leash? This springy, dingy leash? Garbage. Do not have a leash like that for an old dog. It's, it's worthless for training. It's fine for walking a puppy around, which is what I'm using it for. Uh, walking a puppy around, letting her run and jump, and a lot of times she does things she isn't supposed to. I hold the leash tight and it slows her down a little bit. But when you're training a dog on leash, you want to get yourself an English lead. This is how I train Bones to heal and walk on a leash. An English lead is made uh, to go around the dog's neck. It, it's kind of like a choking collar, but it's not a choking collar. It actually grips them tight in the back of the neck like a mother dog would, not in the front so they can't breathe or do anything. Labs like to pull. If you attached a lab to a dog sled, they'd probably pull you around. Maybe wouldn't go where you wanted to go, but they would pull. The English lead scruffs them like a mother. I don't know if you call it scruffing with a dog, but she, like a mother dog will eh, on the back of the neck to correct. That's what an English lead does. And then it has a short leash. So they walk right at your side with your thumb on the little leather part. This would be much better to do in a video. I think an older, uh, if we have a playlist all about training dogs. I might have this on video. Anyway, you walk with the lead right at your side. The minute they start to go, it gets tight and you give it a good solid jerk across the front. You pull them across your front, kind of knocks their head into your leg a little bit. Not hard, not like you're hurting them, just like, nope. And you give them a strong, no. Bones just looked at me like, what, sorry. Just that, and it's a war of attrition. Walk, no, walk, no, walk, no. Eventually, eventually, especially an older dog who hasn't been trained not too early, they will stop. But it is a war of attrition. You can see I'm sitting out here working. Every day I'm out here for an hour, knocking at the puppy to stop jumping up, not to bite, not to be naughty. It's constant. But the key I find is not to take an hour out of every day to train a dog, but to assimilate them into an hour of your day, train them. And the tools I like to use with puppies, try not to be too negative with a little puppy. Your dog, you can go, you know, positive and negative training or um, what's the word, positive and negative reinforcement. With a puppy, mostly you're trying to just distract or get them to stop. So a little spray bottle with just some you know, water in it. We have a fly spray that we use that's safe for the dogs. And uh, so when she's barking at me in her crate, a little spray just distracts her. She's like, what's that? And it gets her to stop. If she's doing something naughty, little spray. Leash, little tug. Throw her a toy that'll get her interest and then move on. You don't want to be like, you know, hurting a puppy, hitting a puppy. You, I, you never want to be hurting your dog. Um, I do use an e-collar for training older dogs and we'll cover that in the future and how to do it kindly and not bad and hurting your dog. Um, but a puppy, I wouldn't even do an e-collar with because they're just too little to handle it. You need to be mostly positive or redirecting. A dog your age that's a bit older, you can get a little firmer with positive and negative reinforcement. And that, that English lead method is a really good one. So look into that. And hopefully that will help with her not pulling on leash and also jumping up. When they jump up, a good strong just knee to push them away from you and a good strong no, that's all I've ever had to do. But we always did that early on because jumping up is absolutely not acceptable. And we found the key is to start when they're a puppy. This puppy here does not jump up. Even though it's cute and oh, so cute. When she does it, when guests come, we say, oh, don't let her do that. 
because if you let her do it as a puppy and she thinks it's great, then when she's 170 pounds and jumping up and you're like, cut it out, she's gonna be confused. Like, wow, you're such a jerk, you used to love this. What happened? Did you start drinking espresso? I don't even know you anymore. For those of you, I'm sorry, the light is like not great today, I'm trying to get it right. For those of you with a smaller homestead, Boy's Life says, I live in the city and only have about one eighth acre backyard. Is there any way to have a mini farm, make a little money growing fresh veggies? If so, how would you recommend I do that? Absolutely, Boy's Life. You could totally do this on an eighth of an acre. Here's what I would suggest with a small homestead looking to make a little bit of money off of veggies. So you have to make the most of the least space you have, so look into more intensive and more productive methods of farming. You would not want to set up, you know, uh, this is obviously an extreme example. You would not want to grow corn and soybeans on your eighth of an acre. You're not going to make any money from that. So you want to look into, I forgot my spray bottle. If she keeps that up, I'm going to have to go get it because that's not acceptable. She's barking at me because she's mad. You're going to focus on things like square foot gardening. You get a lot more production out of a square foot garden. Raised beds, square foot, high intensive management, great way to do it. Look into hydroponic or aquaponics. We did a video a year and a half ago, we went, or no, about a year ago, we went to Jonathan, his hydroponic backyard farm. This is a perfect example. He had a very small setup. He did hydroponic growing, hydroponic plants. It took like a third of the time to grow these plants than they do in soil because you're giving them the nutrients they need and they don't have all the negative stuff. He grew them in a couple of beds he built and the turnaround was within a month. He had a crop, ready, one seed at a month. It was old enough, he could sell it. He was selling heads of lettuce for you know what they were going at the supermarket. I think it was something like six bucks or eight bucks. So every day he had a couple heads of lettuce. He'd run up to the neighbors. He had a, a circuit he was doing. You think about that. I mean, you could make three hundred dollars if you're making ten bucks a day off, you know, your neighbors giving them fresh lettuce every day. That's three hundred bucks a month. That's a car payment you could be doing with a couple little hydroponic beds. I really suggest don't go the aquaponic route if you're new. We made that mistake last year. I jumped into it heavy. Jonathan told me not to. He said, do hydroponics. Don't mess with the fish. The fish had a different element. Go aquaponics, build a few beds, and uh, they are very good for limited space. And you can make vertical aquaponic systems as well. So that helps even more with the limited space. The other thing you can do is that's a quick turnaround, smaller amount of space, is sprouts. Look into producing sprouts. We got some sprouts at a farmer's market. Special shout out, I think his name was John. I gotta get his name next time. He was a viewer of the show. We walked up to the farmer's market here where we go in Pennsylvania, and we wanted to get some sprouts, and I walked up to the booth, and the guy was like, hi, can I homesteady? I watch your show. And I asked him about how the sprout thing was. He's paying all his bills, doing sprouts. And I told him when he gets his system down good, we'll get him on the show. So if you're watching, I think your name is John Sprout Guy. Thanks for watching and I'll see you at the farmer's market this weekend. I'll be there on Saturday. Next question. I really related to this question because uh, I've been very fortunate with this subject and not everyone is and let me explain so Joseph asks as far as homesteading and farming in general how does one go about learning carpentry skills such as building a house or barn Joseph that's a great question and for those of us who aren't natural carpenters I'm talking about myself it really helps to have a mentor sometimes you get this the universe hands you this in the form of a parent or a relative I was so fortunate my dad is a master carpenter he built homes for years back at Squash Hollow all the big building projects I worked with my dad I got him up there and he helped then moving here my father-in-law is also someone who's built homes he's built many different homes he built his own home the one we'll be living in soon uh, so I have someone there that if I need a hand with or I need to ask a question, I can just go and ask. 
I'm, at, I'm guessing by your question that you don't have those mentors. You don't have a family member who's good at this and like me, you're not a natural with this stuff. I am not a natural carpenter. It does not come easy. So what do you do? If you're talking about building a barn or a house, you start small and you get some, if you can't find a mentor, the, you could go around looking at construction sites where people are working, find a place where they're not building a ton of like condo units, but maybe someone just working on a deck at a house, offer to help a couple hours a week, say, I just want to learn. Figure, even though you'd be working for free, you wouldn't have to pay any money to learn. People pay to go to school to learn skills. You could offer your help at a job site, say, I'm a hard working guy, I'll bring my own tools, I want to help. I just need to learn how this works. They're not going to want to say yes to that because you're going to slow them down and you're going to cost them time and time is money. So what you might do is maybe strike up a rapport with the individual just by, I don't know, bring them coffee and donuts and, and ask what they're up to and what the project is and kind of feel them out, see if they'll take the time of day with you. And then, or if you, a friend of a friend kind of thing, if you know anybody who happens to be a carpenter who you could say, listen, I'll come, I'll help one day a week, I'll do the hard work, you don't have to pay me a dime, I just want to learn. There's that option. There's also small projects. You will learn skills doing small projects. So don't start with a house, start with a chicken coop. Better yet, start with a chicken tractor because I got a great resource for you that I'm going to tell you about as soon as the wind stops blowing because that'll bust our audio out. This is why I want a studio. Most of our videos, four days a week, are outside, but for the Q&As, they're long form, lots of talking, and I hate to deal with the, the wind and the trucks and all the noise. So I know some of you guys don't want me to be in a studio. We'll make it look cool. It won't look like, you know, a cubicle, but it sure would help produce these longer videos where we didn't have to worry about the wind and the Jake breaks in the background. And But it would be harder to train dogs in, so I don't know, maybe we'll have to hold off on that one. What were we talking about again? We were talking about building. So I got a great resource for you. There's a plane, I'm telling you, working outside. My buddy John Siskovich from Farm Marketing Solutions. For those of you who have wondered what happened to his videos, he's a very busy man. He's running a farm and a brewery and he's got a family. He hasn't been making a lot of videos lately, but he's got an awesome YouTube channel, a lot of good content there. He's got a great chicken tractor and he's got a chicken tractor book where it shows you exactly how to build that chicken tractor. And it is going to teach you some skills. In that book, there's a few fancy things you have to do for the chicken tractor, a couple hinge cuts. You're gonna learn some basics in carpentry and the book walks you through it. I've been thinking about building a couple myself because they are the best design for a chicken tractor I have seen out there. I have seen John use them. I've you know been inside them, kind of. You can go right inside them. They're, they're like little, little houses. That is a great resource. And for those of you who support this show by being Homesteady Pioneer, if you don't know what that is, five bucks a month, you can become a Homesteady Pioneer. You get bonus content, bonus classes that I used to teach at schools about farming and homesteading, and you get bonus videos. There's 20 podcasts that are only available to Pioneers that you can download with one click. Boom, they're all on your phone. You can listen to them. There's also discounts. And if you're thinking about pasturing chickens and building a pastured poultry chicken tractor, John's books, you get a 10% discount. So that means if you buy all of John's books, it pays for your membership that month because you're gonna save that much money. So it's like a free membership to all this bonus content. There's an in-depth interview with John about pastured poultry for money. There's a whole class on the business of backyard farming. Link below to become a pioneer. It is the way we can do this show. We don't get paid that much from YouTube. Amsteady is an awesome supplement, but it's not the big one. We only can do Homesteady because of you Homesteady Pioneers. We are so thankful and that is why we try to get you things like discounts on chicken tractor books, on plants. If you're putting an orchard in, we get you a 10% discount from you know, Dave at Northeast Edible. There's a lot of stuff. You can learn more, click the link below. And I hope, Joseph, you can learn some carpentry skills from a project like a chicken tractor first and then grow to like a shed and then a house and then a barn and then you're awesome and you could have your own carpentry business at that point because you've done it all. Look at how far you've come, Joseph. I'm so proud of you. I remember back when you hadn't even built the chicken tractor yet. Good work.
I got a project. Will you come help? Sherry from Parsons Shirts, who is going to be working with us to produce an upcoming shirt for Home Study. More on that later. Asks about, they saw a green tank on the side of our building. She wants to know what's in it. They're looking into doing gas at their homestead. Yes, we use a gas cooktop. It is awesome. Gas is totally a great way to go for heat. I don't do anything in the kitchen. I don't cook. I don't bake. Come on, pup. I eat. That's what I do in the kitchen. I walk into the kitchen while Kay is cooking and I eat the food that she's preparing and she yells at me and says, wait till dinner. But according to her, gas is the way to go. So we really like it. There's a lot of safeties built into gas nowadays. You don't have to worry about blowing up your, your house. And uh, yeah, it's nicer than electric. It gets hotter quicker. It's a more um, steady like heat you can count on. Even our oven is gas, so it's really good. We suggest gas. Another neat question from Josh about homestead business. Another neat question about homestead business from Josh. First question from Josh, neat question about homestead business. He's gonna be retiring in a few years. He's gonna start slow, but he wants to make a little bit of money from his homestead to offset the feed cost. My wife doesn't want to start a business at all. How can I ease her into making a few extra dollars here and there? Great question, Josh. This is something that me and Kay experienced. We're now in our 10th year of marriage. Anniversary is coming up in November. But, I mean, we've been running our own business now for, th this is going on our third year, I wanna say, maybe fourth year. I had a job for a long time working with my dad. It was a job I really liked. My dad was an awesome boss and the work was really, it, it was fun work. I enjoyed most days. So all in all, I probably would have stayed doing that, but I have this entrepreneurial drive. I like making money my own way. I like the idea of being able to make as much money as I can figure out how to make. I don't like having a, you know, you get paid $10 an hour and that's what you're worth and that's what you'll get. And having to beg for like a raise, I'm not into that. So I have that entrepreneurial drive. Plus, my family always had their own business, and I was used to the freedom of owning your own business, which we'll get to in a second. Kay did not want to have a business. She wanted me to keep my nice job, get my paycheck each week from my dad. She did not want me to have my own business because of the freedom issue when you own your own business. Her experience with her own business, her dad runs a much larger business than my dad. Much more employees, much more stuff, and for him, the freedom factor was way less. My father-in-law has a really funny line if you're ever talking with him. Gotta wait for the wind here. We'll wait for dramatic effect. We'll go gun shopping together from time to time. And no doubt, there'll be some other guys in the gun store and you start chit-chatting and they'll say, uh, so what do you do? My father-in-law says, oh, I work for myself. I run a business. You say, oh, that's nice. He says, yep. I get to make my own hours. I work half days. And they say, oh man, must be nice. And he goes, yep, five to five, half of the day. And they go, ah. Kay's dad, he has a huge operation that he runs. And so for her growing up, she saw a much different experience with owning your own business. She saw the responsibility of feeding other families, lots of other families, and running such a big business that you couldn't go away for very long. You had to be right there, ready to go. And that's, that's the way it is here uh, with this business here. So for her, the idea of running your own business meant, you know, couldn't really go on vacation hardly ever. Um, you could like a, a week out of the year, but that was that. You had to stay home. You had to be there, dependable for all the other families. You were tethered closely to that business. Whereas for my family, we had a smaller business. If we wanted to take the afternoon off and go on the lake with my dad, he would do it. He'd say, yeah, you know what? We'll, we'll work hard, we'll work fast, and at noon we'll quit and we'll go to the lake. And we did that. And that, to me, was like, I want that. I want to be able to set my own schedule, and I do. I work way more than 40 hours a week. I, last night, was up till 2 a.m. working on the video that came out yesterday. And then I woke up at 8, uh, you know, 7.30 this morning, and I did my walk with the dogs, and I'll work till about 5 o'clock, so there's a full nine-hour day, really. And then 
Tonight, I'll be up again till 1 a.m. or 12 a.m. working on videos for tomorrow. I work way more hours, but I love what I'm doing, so I get to call the shots, and if I want to take a day off with, I don't know, my best buddy accountant Mike and, you know, go foraging into a farmer's market this weekend, just throwing that out there hypothetically, yeah, I'm gonna do that. And that's what's nice about running your own business. So I'm getting off on a tangent of why it's great to have your own business, but Josh already knows why it's great. He wants to do it. He's sick of other people telling him what to do and he wants to use his own smarts to you know, make his own little money on his homestead. So how do you get your significant other on board with this? Well, what happened with us, Josh, I don't know that I'm gonna recommend this to you, but I'll just tell you what happened. I wanted to start a lot of businesses, this podcast being one of them, and then I, th and initially Kay was like, no, don't do that. I don't want you to do that. And then I threw out an even bigger, crazier idea that from our farm, we would start a farm food truck and we would partner with my mom who loves to cook and wanted to have a food truck. And we would provide all the food and she would cook out of the truck, but we'd have to buy the truck and that was like $60,000 to get all ready to go. You had to get approvals from the town. And uh, then we were trying to figure out scheduling and I'd have to give her deliveries early in the morning. Kate was like, whoa, go do that podcast. So you could always like, you know, start asking for a pony if you want to get a cat. Really though, the best way I think with any homestead business is just to start slow, build surplus, and then at that point, there's no other option other than throwing the stuff away. And your wife, she seems like a reasonable girl, woman. She's not a girl, she's clearly a woman. Um, yeah, babe, look at all these eggs. They're going bad, they're rotting. I'm, I'm just gonna put a little stand Joseph's gonna help me build a stand because he's such a good carpenter now. A little stand at the end of our road where people can go and get farm fresh eggs. And uh, you know, it's we have all these eggs sitting here, they're going bad. We're gonna just put them in the thing and at the end of the week we'll see what happens. And at the end of the week there's you know 50 bucks there. And Hey, you know what babe, I'm gonna take you out to lunch. We got 50 bucks in the egg, kitty. I only need 14 for a bag of feed. I'm gonna take you out to lunch. That starts to feel pretty good. A month of that, now that's like best case scenario. What's more likely is you're gonna have like $8 in the thing at the end of the week and you're like, well, this pays for half of our feed, <laughs> but it can grow. If you start with $8, that can become 14 and that can become 50. And the point is you're gonna build the surplus first to know that you can actually do it. You're not gonna spend a bunch of money to start up your business and get t-shirts made and print business cards. You're just gonna get your livestock and produce a product sit and then you're going to produce more of that and as soon as you start having more than your family can use you're going to have the option of giving it away which is nice that builds a different kind of currency with people hey here's some free eggs next time you need help you know building your egg stand at the end of the road joseph's going to come help you because you gave him free eggs but there's also getting real currency that you can spend on other things like taking your wife out to lunch. Build the surplus, monetize the surplus, treat your wife with that monetization, and uh, I don't think she'll have too much of a problem with that. She seems like a real reasonable woman. All my interaction with her at least has seemed that way. So, next question. <laughs> Evie? First, let me say I've become obsessed with your channel. Thank you, Evie. Keep watching. Don't skip the commercials. That's how we pay the bills, kind of, part of it. You guys are a huge source of great information and just your family dynamic is great to watch. I won't argue with that. Second, my Ask Homesteady question is this. What made you choose a smaller Jersey cow over any of the other smaller milk cows? And what can you say about Jersey temperament? You cannot beat Jersey milk. There is no milk out there that you can pour into a glass for me and have me drink and say, yes, this is better. And it's not just me. It's the butter fat content. There is more rich butter fat in that Jersey milk, which humans like. We like buttery, fatty things. You ever had a donut, a croissant? I mean, I'm just saying. There are other options out there for small, mini homestead milk cows. There's the Dexters, uh, American Milking Devons. Eh, they just don't have the quality of the Jersey milk. As far as the temperament goes, 
Ladybug has been an amazing cow. There's a little bit of drama. Sometimes she holds up. She's holding back cream right now. If we would wean Luna, we could definitely get that cream from her. She's kind of saving it for her baby, so you gotta work with that. But Kay has thoroughly enjoyed working with Ladybug. There's been no issues as far as bad temperament. Uh, the birth went smooth. What I suggest to anyone thinking, and Kay would back me up on this, she, she would say this too. When we were getting Ladybug, we weren't sure whether or not to get a cow or a calf and raise the calf. Hands down, we have learned from this experience, start with a cow that has already been trained to milk. That is going to be more money, that is gonna be harder to find, I understand that, but it will be worth its weight in gold. Get yourself a mid-sized jersey, don't worry about the mini jersey, you don't have to get one of those expensive mini goofy ones. Mid-size is fine like Ladybug, she's perfect size for a family, she produces like two gallons a day. When we don't calf share, we'd get like two gallons a day, more probably, which is more than most families ever need. She has great quality milk and working with her because she's not a stubborn little calf who's never been trained. She was trained by professional, you know, people who do this with lots of cows. She's been so easy to work with, easy to train. She's been great. Her temperament, there's a little bit of Jersey flair, but you know, it's just, it's, it, there's personality there. Whereas other cows may be less and more willing to just do whatever you want, but I don't know. Ladybug's been great. We cannot enough recommend that you get yourself a midsize, you know, family size jersey and start with a started cow. Somewhat, a cow that's already freshened, already been through milking once that you can ask and say, is she a good milker? Is she gonna stand nicely for me? And if the answer is yes, save your money. You know, if it means you have to wait an extra year, it's worth the wait because getting a calf is not the same thing. Our experience with Luna is much different than Ladybug. Not bad, just more work. Fortunately, we already are enjoying the benefit of having the cow versus having a calf where you haven't had milk. The first year and a half, there's gonna be no milk and you're gonna be dealing with a little stubborn cow who doesn't wanna listen. So start with a, start with a cow, not a calf. and. Um, Jersey milk. If you're doing it for the milk, get the best quality milk you can. Don't even start with the, the milking Devons and the Dexters and any of that. The milk, you can't beat Jersey. You can't. Ellie wants to know, she has a small acre that's taken up by weeds. I would like to get a couple pygmy or Nigerian dwarf goats, but worried about the goats eating something poisonous and dying. Well, they know what is poisonous to them and leave it alone. And super fan T. Rue goes ahead and answers this for her, but I figured we'd throw it on this episode because this is just a good topic to remind people of time to time. The answer to this is not necessarily. If you let your goats free on a thousand acres, they're probably not gonna eat anything that's poisonous. Generally speaking, the plants you will get in trouble with are ones that people have planted. Perfect example of that uh, that you might have is azaleas or rhododendrons. A lot of those have been planted on properties and they are highly poisonous. Now the wild version of that, the mountain laurel, you may not have planted and like at our own homes, our old homestead, you may have that and that is a big problem for goats. And yes, like Tiru, Tiru? I'll get it, Tiru. Like Tiru said in the comment, uh, we lost a goat to this. They, for some reason, would run to gobble it up. So goats will not always avoid poisonous weeds. There are times when they will definitely gulp them down. So what you need to do is educate yourself. Take walks through that. Is it a full acre or a small acre? It's only an acre, you can walk it. Get a good idea of the plants that are out there. Know what mountain laurels, rhododendrons look like, the azaleas. Uh, find out in your area, if there's other people who own goats, what to look out for. I was told here on this property, there is a bush that the butterflies like that's bad for goats. I've also found milkweed is out there. So you have to become a little bit familiar with this stuff before you let the goats out. And then just as a precaution, never let them out on an empty stomach the first time. I'll let them be full so that they go around browsing and nibbling. Sometimes a goat will get into a little bit of a toxic plant. We've had that happen before. They will get a little bit sick and then they will not touch it again because they will learn. Unfortunately, the first goats we lost to this problem gorged themselves and killed themselves. So they can do that. They will do that from time to time. 
Uh, I wouldn't be overly worried about it, but first identify the predominant weeds. And that is not easy. It's hard to do. I haven't found a good solution for weed identification other than just learning what is dangerous. Don't try to identify all the weeds in your property. That'll take you a lifetime. Instead, just try to I learn what the bad ones look like and then make sure they're not there. There's only a few you're gonna have to worry about. And those, I mentioned most of them right there. Cray Hack wants to know about have we ever thought about training the shepherd to tend the goats so they don't need to be tethered? Uh, that shepherd does come from a working line. However, he is not trained to that. I'm not experienced in that and I have no plans on training livestock dogs right now. We keep all our livestock safe just by having dogs on the property that can't get to the livestock but can keep away predators and we keep the dogs away from the livestock. And my, my labs, I have very well trained to not go to the livestock, but I wouldn't uh, leave the shepherd without training and I don't know how to, I've never trained a dog to do livestock stuff. So, sorry Cray Hack, you won't see us doing that. Not anytime soon. Rocky, do the Muscovy ducks make a lot of noise? Um, from time to time they just go, Adrian, quack, quack. I'm sorry, that was, I had to. That was dumb, you probably get that all the time. My name is Austin and every time I introduce myself, my name is Austin Martin. And people are like, really? So do you drive one? And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I just have my canned response, which is, uh, it's Austin Martin, not Aston Martin. Wasn't close enough to get me one, but I'm tis. Anyway, Rocky, maybe that's not even your real name. Maybe that's just your YouTube handle, so. Maybe you don't get that joke all the time. Muscovy ducks, the males do not make much noise. They make like a hissing noise. <laughs> like that and they wag their tail. Muscovies are a very quiet breed. If you have noise issues, uh, the Muscovies we got were from a property where the town, it was illegal to own ducks and the people had those ducks for that, like for probably years because nobody knew because they were super quiet and then like a neighbor across the street found out and was getting all you know neighbors and uh, so they were getting rid of the ducks because they had to sell the ducks because the town found out and they were gonna charge them like thirty thousand dollars because of the you know breaking the rules about ducks which is just highway robbery I mean don't even get me started I, I think last week I went into a tangent about how I can't stand you know town regulations that prevent people from being homesteady. So I won't go into a, a tangent or a rant because nobody asked, but it's there and it's ready. It's ready to go. Gonna go up in fisticuffs. Muscovy drakes are pretty quiet. I should have said that. They're not called male ducks. Ducks are always female. They're Muscovy drakes. Kind of like a cow is a female and a bull is a male. Yeah, like that. But a lot of times people just say cow to describe any bovine. Cattle. C. Next question is... Oh, I like this one. C. Charles Charlson, who also helped us come up with the name Gizmo, uh, also asks about... We're making a new t-shirt, new homesteady design, which we uh, asked your opinion on earlier in the week. It's the Homesteady logo superimposed into like a Jurassic Park scene with a big cow skeleton going raw instead of the Tyrannosaurus Rex. Longtime fans, especially podcast listeners, know how much I love Jurassic Park. It played a huge, like, it apparently affected my life a ton because I talk about it all the time. And we made a little Jurassic Park joke this week. And C. Charleston wants to know, am I more like Ian Malcolm or Alan Grant? And then they said, with all the fecal tests, I'm sure Kay is most definitely Ellie. Kay is most definitely Ellie. Her and Ellie, I mean, maybe that's, I, I was, I mean, very impressionable when I watched Jurassic Park. Maybe right then and there I recognized Ellie as just like, you know, my dear Dr. Sattler. But now let's talk. Ian Malcolm or Dr. Grant? I hate to admit this. I want to be a Dr. Grant, you know? That's who I want to be. I'm definitely more of an Ian Malcolm. I think when it comes down to personalities, me and Ian Malcolm are just a little bit different. Uh, he's definitely extroverted. He's got that, you know, Ian Malcolm suave thing going on. He likes to talk to people and sound smart. I like to talk to people. I like to sound smart. Um, we both have, you know, the black hair thing going, so that's good too. 
and the Jeff Goldblum good looks. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Ian Malcolm, like, he was smart, he liked to talk and theorize and, uh, you know, shoot holes in things when he saw problems. But when it came down to it, like, most of the movie he spent reclined in the back of a car while other people kind of drove him around. Uh, must go faster, must go faster. Dr. Grant was like your boots on the ground, digging in the holes, didn't want to be bothered with the audience. The beginning of Jurassic Park, all the people want to see the skeleton and they all kind of gather around and Dr. Grant starts telling that story and the kids like interrupting him and it's like, it looks like a big turkey. And Dr. Grant just doesn't want to be bothered uh, when the helicopter comes flying in. He doesn't care. He's just like, he just wants to dig bones. And if I were more like Dr. Grant, I would actually be a farmer. I would be like my buddy John Siskovich who, when he had to choose between farming and homesteading, I'm sorry, farming and, and YouTube videos. Well, this summer he spent farming and he's not making a ton of videos. You know, he's like doing the work. Whereas I like to have a homestead with way less work than a farm and, you know, spend most of my time making fancy looking videos talking about the couple animals that we own. But if I was more like Dr. Grant, this would actually be a farm and there would be no YouTube videos. So for you, it's a good thing I'm more like Ian Malcolm. Um, for the farm and for Dr. Sattler upstairs here. Uh, probably better off if I was a bit more Grant-like. But I, I, I know myself enough to know that, uh, yeah, Ian Malcolm. Or what you should have asked was Dr. Grant, Ian Malcolm, or John Hammond. Because really, when it comes down to it, a guy who spends a ton of money on really bad fencing refuses to admit when he's defeated, and spares no expense, uh, that's my spirit animal right there. Next question. Oh, and John Hammond was feeding goats to Tyrannosaurus Rexes. I would totally do that. Sorry, girls. I don't mean that. It would be male goats. It would be bucks. You're good for milk. Last couple questions are about hunting because we released a video this week where we were talking about bow hunting. And, um, Candace asks, Candace gets questions in week for, I mean forever, Candace has been asking questions forever on this Ask Home Study. Uh, her 13 year old daughter has a beautiful recurve bow. She took some lessons with 4-H. Is there anything you can hunt with a recurve bow as opposed to a compound bow? Obviously she couldn't shoot a deer, winky face. Candace, actually you can shoot deer with a recurve bow. Now, your 13-year-old daughter might not be able to hunt deer with a recurve bow right now. Generally, a state states will have a poundage like rule, and you can find out from a bow shop, a pro shop, if she would be getting enough force in her bow to shoot large game. Generally, it's about 40 pounds of pull that they cut you off at, and a lot of recurves are 40 pound pull. The thing with the recurve versus the compound there's no magnification of that. You don't pull back, you know, 40 and then get 80. You just pull back all 40 and then you release all 40. So it's harder, but you can hunt with them. Recurves, totally legal, totally have enough power, but you do need to be a better shot at them than a cop. Like, they take a lot more skill. So if your daughter practices and builds up the strength and can do a legal bow, she could totally hunt with a recurve. Now, I don't know if her recurve will be powerful enough to handle that, so that's a question. Now, you asked if they can, if she could hunt other animals other than deer. There, again, your state will have its own regulations. You have to go to the DNR's website, or whatever they call DNR, Department of Natural Resources, your game commission. You can find this online for your state where you live. Uh, for small game, like squirrels, rabbits, even some small predators like coyotes, she could probably use the recurve she has for those things. And a lot of times, what you will change with the, the arrow is the, the tip. So what you're using for you know, a field tip, practicing, you'll want to change that. So your arrows instead will, like a squirrel, you could use a blunt tip that would just hit the squirrel's head and kill it like that. Or you could have something with a blade on it that you would shoot through. But there's a different depending on what she wants to hunt, there's different broadheads for every animal, and legally there's different rules for every state for every small animal. So the answer is yes, 
You have to look into it and it will much depend on your daughter's strength, how much she practices, and what the laws of your state are. And contrary to what people who don't know anything about hunting often will say, hey, it's my property, I should be able to shoot what I want. That's not how it works. You can never just hunt things, even a squirrel has a season and you have to buy a license for, even if it's a squirrel on your own property. So look into your state, the regulations, find those answers. If you're interested in hunting, trust me, you have to get interested in finding out regulations and rules. Otherwise you can go to jail and be fined a ton of money. So when it comes to hunting, you gotta just say, all right, I'm gonna learn the regulations, take a hunter safety course, go through all the work. And at that point, just get her a compound bow and get her on some deer. And I mean, your 13 year old daughter can totally be hunting deer with a compound bow for sure, absolutely. Last question of today, and then I actually think we got through most of the questions from this week. There's none of the older questions answered, but at least this week's were covered. Dean says, hey Austin, Dean got a couple questions in. Good work, Dean. What would the pros and cons be of leaving more of the prime young trophy bucks to breed another season or two before harvest so you have more future big harvests? Would love to hear your thoughts on this. I am a food first hunter. I started hunting because I wanted to eat good quality food and I didn't have any land to grow that on at the time. And that is still why I hunt, food first. I'm not a trophy hunter in the terms of that I just am going out to shoot big, you know, big antler deer and trophy animals. That's not my goal. Uh, my goal is to feed my family. Now, getting to see a trophy buck in the wild is like anything special in the wild. You know, people who are bird watchers get excited to see certain birds. The pileated woodpecker is something people get all excited about seeing because it's rare. It's this huge bird and it's rare and you don't get to see them all the time, but when you do, you get excited about them. If you're a fisherman and you catch the biggest bass you've ever caught, you get excited. Why? Because it's rare, because it's special, because it's something you don't get to do every day. It's not easy. It shows that you've put your time in. That is how I view shooting a big buck. I like shooting a big buck. I get excited when a big buck walks in front of me because it's rare. I've been hunting for almost nine years now. And in nine years, every year I see maybe one, maybe two big bucks in the field. Driving around town, I might see one other. Most people who aren't hunters will never see a big mature buck. Seeing a trophy buck or a big buck is a rare experience, not because they're a rare animal or like an extinct animal. There are a ton of big bucks out there. The reason no one gets to see them is because they are sneaky, they are elusive. Does raise the young. There's no family unit like you saw in Bambi. Well, actually, even Bambi got that right. The dad didn't get involved until the mom was out of the picture. Classic males. The big bucks mate. They spend a week or two out of the year running around mating as much as they can. And then they go off and they do their thing and they don't stay with the herd. So generally, when you see large groups of deer eating in a field, it's mostly does and young bucks. The older bucks, they're hiding. They're in the woods just off by themselves. They don't have to feed the young. They don't need any responsibility. They like to just survive alone. So they go off by themselves. You don't get to see them often in your day-to-day -day life. In the field hunting, I every year maybe get to see one, two. It is very rare, very special. Like observing Haley's Comet, Comet, Comet. If Haley's Comet went around the earth every day, nobody would care about it. The moon goes around every day, and when was the last time you looked up at the moon and was like, wow, that's beautiful. Maybe once a month on a full moon. Rare things are special and unique, and so there's value to that. That's why when I get a chance to shoot a big buck, I'm excited because it's rare, it's something special, and even if I don't get to shoot it, that's not the point. Seeing the big buck is the rare and special thing, and the fact that I'm out there hunting to feed my family, I also will shoot it when it walks okay. by. Now, shooting a big buck versus a middle-aged buck is also a good thing for the deer herd because, one, the big buck, he is a smart buck, he has good genetics, he's old now, 
He has spread those genetics generation, 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 now have those genetics. He is going to die. Deer in the wild, they don't make it past, most of them don't make it past five or six. Uh, seeing a buck older than that is extremely rare. Normally the bucks you see are two and three. So if you see a big trophy buck, he's their teeth wear out, they will starve to death because they can't get the nutrients they need, they can't eat what like they need to, and so they just grow old and they die. So if you see a big buck and you shoot him, you're you're taking a, a you're not taking a breeder out of the gene pool. He's already given his genetics. He's old and he's going to die of natural causes. So you're taking that out, and it's that special you know big beautiful animal. And I get my bucks taxidermied, not so I can brag about how many big bucks I've shot because there is nothing that puts you back in the woods reliving that real life experience than seeing the deer just like he was in the woods that day. I've taken pictures, pictures are okay, you put them up on the wall and they're nice to see, but looking at that real rack and that real looking animal, it's majestic, it's beautiful. I, I love going to the Museum of Natural History and looking at the taxidermy there. I didn't kill any of it, I'm just impressed by the animals and the wildlife and being able to put a little bit of that into my own house and reliving those experiences, not the, sh the killing. It, hunting is not about the killing. It's about walking through the woods with your, you know, your kids and scouting. The buck that I shot here a couple years ago, me and my son were scouting together and we found him. He, he jumped and he took off running. And I was with my son, it was the first time he ever saw a buck in the woods. We put the blind up together me and him, we picked the spot, cut the trees, put it all up, we were there, we picked that spot, and then me and my daughter happened to be together the day that that buck came back, and I had my bow and arrow ready. And my daughter got to see a, a, something that most grown people never get to see, a mature white-tailed buck during breeding season, tending a doe, walking through the woods. She got to see her dad with a bow and arrow, a more primitive, it's not primitive, but like, you know, a bow and arrow, it's not like, you know, a, you're not shooting a machine gun at the deer, nobody is, but it's just this, this experience that my daughter still talks about. She was five at the time, and it was two years ago, she still talks about it when she sees the mount or big deer. And that taxidermy brings it to life. You don't get to have that experience with mature bucks if you shoot younger bucks. If you shoot the younger bucks on your property, you will not get to see the big mature deer. It's the same as catch and release with fishing. If you don't release that fish to live another day, you're never gonna have a trophy fish in your pond. You might get really fortunate one time and actually get one. Same with deer, if you shoot all the little bucks, you still might see one big buck once in a while. But if you let the little bucks keep living, while they're healthy and they're breeding and let time go by, they get to get bigger and older. And then when he's old, you get that awesome experience of seeing that majestic buck. And then he's gonna die anyway of old age. You're the one to you know put a quick clean kill on him. And then you take him and you get him taxidermied and he's up on the wall and you get to enjoy reliving your time in the woods, that whole experience, that's special. Otherwise, He's gonna die of old age in the woods somewhere and rot away and get chewed on by coyotes. So, no, I'm not a trophy hunter in the sense of like, you know, I'm this braggadocio guy who goes and only shoots for big heads. But letting smaller bucks go to be bigger, letting them get their genes out into the gene pool, and then getting to have more experiences with large, tr you know, big, majestic animals like that one I got the picture of the other day on that game camera. It's just fun, it's exciting, uh, it's special. And if you really, if you're a hunter, you totally get this. And if you're a non-hunter, you might kind of get it and you might not, and that's okay. But that's why, Dean, that's why I like to, I pass little bucks, I won't shoot little bucks. Now, when it comes to food quality, nothing beats does for food quality. Bucks, generally speaking, will have a more gamey flavor, and we've decided with the bucks that we get, we usually will turn them into more ground products, like, you know, uh, sliced meats and things, whereas the does we will keep and have for steaks. Does are great quality eating, and I this year have three tags. One is a buck tag and two doe tags. I can't use my buck tag on a doe, 
So that's going to hopefully we'll get a nice big buck off the property and the other two does, we'll get a couple good does. They'll all be eaten. We'll use every part of all those animals. You know, we'll fill our freezers up. And that's why I hunt. And it's something that I really, really enjoy. And yeah, it's one of my favorite parts of homesteading. So thanks for asking all the great questions today, everybody. Stay tuned for next week. We're gonna have some really nice videos next week. We're gonna talk about the new homesteading shirts. We're gonna do something for 50,000 subscribers. So don't miss out on that. And we will see you then. We'll see you next week. Let's shut her down. All right, girls. Well done on the weeds today. You made some serious progress.